Thank you, Mr. Howie. That's uh, some of these words from these songs that we have. Uh, Mr. McLean mentioned it with some of the hymns. It's just we, we know what we're waiting on. We, we know that the kingdom of God is the only hope that we really have, and, and to hear them vocalized to music sometimes just pricks at the heart just, in, just enough. And it fits so well with what we're going to discuss today. If you remember on the Feast of Trumpets, we started discussing God's holy day plan, his holy days and how that is his plan. That, that's the plan that he's put before us, and it portrays significant events that are have either taken place or are going to take place in the future. Here at the fall holy days, it's all those future events that are going to be taking place. So today I want to continue with that chronology and, and work through how the Day of Atonement is fitly woven into all the other holy days, and, and especially the Feast of Tabernacles as we're getting ready to see what this means as far as humanity being reconciled to God. And, and the impact that that's going to have. I mean, it, it's pure genius to watch how God unfolded his plan and, and why he has us do this year after year. This reminder that we have. I, I think about 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 25, where it says the foolishness of God is wiser, or the, the foolishness of God is wiser than men. It shows us that there's, there's no level of wisdom that we can come to. There, there's no amount of technology that we can invent, nothing that we can build that's going to compare to God's wisdom and what he has done and what he's doing currently. I always bring that to the forefront of my mind when I try to think I'm doing pretty good. Humanity's doing pretty good. We've accomplished so many things. So I want to begin by going back to Leviticus 23. If you turn over there with me, we'll go straight to where... God establishes this as his instructions for what, what Moses is expected to do as well as all of Israel. If you look at Leviticus 23, verse 26, here we find the instructions for the Day of Atonement. We'll read verses 26 through 32. It says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Also the tenth day of the seventh month shall be the Day of Atonement. So we're in that same month as the Feast of Trumpets. It shall be a holy convocation for you. You shall afflict your soul and offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. And you shall do no work on that same day, for it is the day of atonement, to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For any person who is not afflicted in soul on, the, on that same day shall be cut off from his people. And any person who does any work on that same day shall that person I will destroy from among his people. You shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. It shall be to you a Sabbath of solemn rest, and you shall afflict your souls on the ninth day of the, mo uh, of the month at evening, from evening to evening. You shall, you shall, shall celebrate your Sabbath. So it goes through this description of what the expectations are. And if you caught that right in the middle, God said there's a heavy penalty. For those who break this, the Day of Atonement and what it means, who don't respect the no work and the afflicting our soul, there, there's heavy penalties for that. There's a heavy, heavy penalty any time we turn away from God, any time we re reject his instructions, the plans that he has for us. Now, I want to drop back. If you go back just a couple of chapters to chapter 16, I want to, I want to read a little bit here also. Uh, while the term Day of Atonement never appears or is never mentioned here, we can understand that this is clearly talking about the same time. It gives us the specific date as far as when this takes place, so we can tell that it correlates. But also at the same time, we can see so many spiritual elements that, are, that correlate to exactly what we read from Leviticus 23 and the mentality of what's going on on the Day of Atonement. It's a clear, it run, it's a theme throughout chapter 16. So I look at chapter 16 and verse 29 and 30. It says, This shall be a statute forever for you. In the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict your souls and do no work on it, whether a native of your own country or a stranger who dwells among you. For, you, for on this day, the priest shall make atonement for you to cleanse you, 
that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. There was one time a year that the priest could go into the Holy of Holies. It was on the Day of Atonement to make reconciliation for all of Israel. One day a year. When you think about the significance of that, if this, the impact that that would have, that this is the only time each year that this would take place. There's a heavy impact of that. So what does this word make atonement mean? What, what does that actually mean to us? Well, if we looked it up, it would mean to cover over, to purge, to make reconciliation for. If we think about that, it's a little bit abstract. It's not something that we commonly use, and especially in English, to get an easy understanding of what exactly to cover over would mean what this atonement word is for us, and especially understanding in the Hebrew. Oftentimes we try to do these word, word studies to try to really root out what each word means. So I, I want to take a, a look at the concrete meaning of what make atonement is for us. We deal with it all the time. We may not realize it, but this is something that takes place regularly for us. It's not something that we don't ever experience. Most commonly, it's, it's done human to human because this is a, a point where any time an offense has been made, when we think about atonement, we think about the offenses that we make to God. That's why that priest has, the high priest has to go into the Holy of Holies to make reconciliation. Well, every single day, we make offenses one to another. Knowingly or unknowingly, we offend people. And it's how we react and what we do that helps us to to sort out and figure out what it is that we're supposed to be doing in our life to represent Jesus Christ and God the Father, to show their character more than ours. So when someone is offended, we have options of what we can take, the courses of action that can be taken upon. So that offense is made. We express this idea of atonement through the word forgiveness. We most commonly refer to it as forgiveness because that's what we do. We forgive each other. When somebody steps on our toes, we forgive them for that. When they make a rude comment, we end up forgiving them. This happens day in and day out between us. That's the most common form that we can think of, that we can correlate to what this make atonement would mean, how we, we fit this into God's understanding and, and this outward action. This outward physical action of actually covering over an error, an offense. So hopefully that helps to solidify these actions. Because there was a very physical action that Jesus Christ took to cover over our sins. It was at that point where he gave up his own life. He was executed on our behalf. There was a reconciliation that took place at that point in time which no longer required a physical animal being sacrificed every single year. We could have sacrificed every single animal on the planet, and it wouldn't have ever measured up to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. If you drop down just a couple verses to verse 34 here in Leviticus 16, it says, This shall be an everlasting statue for you to make atonement for the children of Israel for all their sins once a year. And he did as the Lord commanded Moses. Once a year, Israel could be reconciled to God, could be covered over for the, penalty, for the errors that they made throughout the year, whatever it may be when they turned away from God. And this is a tradition that's been carried through the Jewish faith year after year. From the Feast of Trumpets all the way through the Day of Atonement, they go through this 10-day day process. It's a tradition for them to go through this process of reconciling to God by rooting out and self-searching and trying to figure out their errors. They do soul-searching to understand exactly where they have infringed on that relationship with God, what the mistakes that they have made. And they go through this repentance process for these 10 days, looking at how they can change, how they can do better. And this is a, an extremely appropriate response that makes sense. In order to reconcile to God, we have to understand where we mess up with God. We have to do that. 
We can't just say, all right, I'm fixed. Let's, do, let's keep going. If we never really actually focus and try to figure out what it is that we're messing up, what, what those stumbling blocks are in our life. So they take this time, these 10 days. If you remember on the, day of, on the Feast of Trumpets, we went through Joel in the very beginning. So if you turn over to Joel with me, I want to carry on just past where we read in Joel chapter 2. Because it continues in the same mindset, showing where we are, this pattern that we have today, these holy days that we keep today, and how significant they are. So we, we read through verse 11 of chapter 2 on trumpets. So today I want to go through Joel 2, 12 through 16. Because it carries on the same exact mindset of what we're going through right now. It says... Now, therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, to send your heart and not your garment, uh, to rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. Who knows if he will turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. So it talks about with fasting and weeping and with mourning. And immediately after that, it says, rend your hearts, not your garments. It was common practice that there was a physical outward emotion of when things went wrong, when things happened, and they would physically tear their garments. We're being instructed here, don't do that. That outward sign of us just ripping our clothing means nothing if we don't change our heart. It means nothing if we aren't impacted on a level deeper than just the outward of what people can see. Then we carry on. In verse 15, it says, Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a sacred assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and nursing babes, let your bridegroom go out from his chamber, and the bride from her dressing room. This fits well in what we're going through. We started out in the Feast of Trumpets, that blast signifying the return of the rightful king, that perfect king that'll take his place. And today, we're fasting. We're assembling. We're calling together God's chosen people, God's children. Those who are attempting to become first fruits. I say attempting because this life determines whether or not we become that first fruit. It's by, we, we know it's by no actions that we do, but there is expectations placed on us. We can never live a good enough life to be accepted into God's family. But through his mercy and his grace, he overlooks our faults. He overlooks our errors. If we can pick ourselves up, if we can look deep inside our hearts and say, I don't want to do that again. I have to be different. I have to be somebody different. A different example, different character. We have to focus. We have to have a laser beam focus on why we are living this life. Where we're going. What we're fighting for. Because if we stop fighting as individuals, nobody's going to fight for us. We have to do it. And again, it's through grace and mercy that we even even have an opportunity to do it. And through this reconciliation process that God has given us an opportunity to, to be part of that family. If you would, flip back to 1 Corinthians 11 with me. We don't normally read this here, but in the the spring holy days. But it correlates exactly the the differences to the Jewish traditions and what we're dealing with now. If you look at 1 Corinthians 11 and verses 27 through 29. It says, Therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup 
of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man ex examine himself, and, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he, he who eats and drinks of, in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So why are we seeing this at different times? The Jewish nation that we know today, they still go through this process, this evaluation of themselves between trumpets and the Day of Atonement. For us, we tend to see this take place at a different time of year. We see a different impact that it has, uh, this impact around Passover. This heart searching, this soul searching that we have, the rooting down the problems that we've had all year long that we don't want to have anymore. The spiritual meaning of Passover to God's people today is what the day, Feast of Trumpets and the Day of Atonement, this time frame, has for the Jewish nation. And it's because they haven't accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior yet. We understand the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made on our part. As we get into Passover, that's when we are impacted on this personal level. They're still waiting on their Savior. They're still waiting on him. But we know the impact that Jesus Christ has for our lives, what that means for us. Passover is a very individual thing. It's very personal. The Day of Atonement portrays this event for the nation. We went through Leviticus 23 and it talked about it covered over the sins of the nation, this entire people. An entire nation of people in this reconciling to God. Because the nation messed up over and over again. Just like we as individuals mess up over and over again. We're stuck in a country that isn't focused on God. Any country we go to in the entire world would not be focused on God. And so now we're a scattered people. We're a scattered people who collectively but individually work towards the kingdom of God. Work towards a relationship and a commitment, a covenant that we make as individuals with God. And that's that covenant of baptism. That's why it's necessary and it's required for us to become baptized. Each of us at our own point in time. Some are still working up to that point. Many of us have already been there. And we continue to work to live a life worthy of that calling. Live a life worthy of making that commitment with God. So if we think about atonement, this reconciliation process, it's a large scale. It's reconciling all of humanity to God. This impact that it has of drawing us back into a relationship with our Father. All of humanity. Turn over to Romans chapter 5 with me. If you look at Romans 5 verse 6. We see a, a difference between what we find in the Old Testament and New Testament slightly. Same premise. But there's a, a, a difference. We're going to read verses 6 all the way down through 11. It says... For we, when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. It's basically saying, for good people, we would die for. If they're, if they're good and righteous, somebody might die for them. It says, but God demonstrates his own love towards us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We didn't, we didn't deserve it. We still don't deserve it. He's saying, I sacrificed my son for unworthy people. It says, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. So it's interesting that that nuanced difference that I mentioned. We can go through the entire New Testament and we can't find atonement. 
We can't find the word atonement in the New Testament. We don't find that translation. Instead, we find forms of it. We find forms of it. Different meanings. Some of them being ransom, redemption, propitiation, reconciliation, sacrifice, taking away sins, justification. These words aren't the same as atonement. But when we really start looking at them, we start understanding what atonement is and with the, paired up with the meaning of these words and what it was that Jesus Christ did for us. In the BDAG lexicon, reconciliation equals the exchange of hostility for a friendly relationship. Kind of goes back to that forgiveness that we talked about in the beginning. When we offend somebody... We create some hostility between us. There's, there's some action that has taken place that's put a barrier. Well, we want to get back to a friendly relationship. That's why we ask for forgiveness. That's why we say, I'm sorry. Oftentimes, if just those simple words, I'm sorry, aren't said, there, there's this brashness. There's harshness in the attitude between two people. And I've watched people for years not reconcile, not come back together. And sometimes it's over silly stuff. Sometimes it's serious. But more often than not, it's silly stuff that we get upset about and that we hurt each other over. But thinking about trying to get back into this relationship, this friendly relationship out of a hostile relationship, that's where we want to get with God. That's our goal. We want to be in a sinless state so that we can have a positive relationship with our Father. Get back to a state that's good, that's friendly. But because we sin, we know there's always some sort of hostility. And it's how we react to that sin in our lives. It's the steps that we take to try to change from that sinful state and say, nope, I can do better. God expects better. And that as we work through that process, we get back into a friendly relationship. No longer is it hostile. Mr. Crone brought up Isaiah 59. He went through that, talking about that fight that we have with God. We, we break that relationship. He says he's hidden from, from his face. When we find ourselves in that state, but that's because of us. God never draws away from us. He never pulls away from us. But the actions that we take divide us. They separate us. If you flip over just a couple pages to Romans 8, we see a, a correlation here. The same idea of how people are cut off from God. What happens with that? It ends up leaving us groping and confused in darkness, trying to find our way back at times. If you look at Romans 8 and verse 7, It says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, that basically means uh, there's a hatred or hostility towards God. So enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. As human beings, if we stay as human beings, stuck as human beings, we can't ever please God. But we have a mission, we have an objective, and we have a goal to try to. And God has given us access to his Holy Spirit in an attempt to help us to continue to repair that relationship and not destroy it further or push away. We aren't connected when we have hatred towards somebody. And if we sin, we have hatred towards God and towards his laws. We put up those barriers and we separate ourselves. Oftentimes we feel guilty. It's us who separate ourselves from God. We tend to push even further and further away because we feel as we sin, we feel less worthy and less worthy and less worthy. And it's this nasty, dark spiral that we can sometimes put ourselves into. But it's remembering that this covenant, this promise of the Holy Spirit, that is what continues to drive us back into a relationship. 
That's what drives us back to an attitude of asking for forgiveness and changing what we're doing with our lives, how we live our lives. If you turn over to Colossians 1 with me, we'll see that God wants us to be reconciled to him. It, he doesn't, it doesn't please him for us to be separated from him. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 19. If we just think about his holy days, and this plan that we're going through now, his plan is all geared around drawing people to him, drawing humanity into a relationship with God, into his family. That's everything that his entire holy days are built around. In Colossians 1, starting in verse 19, it says, For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you, who once were alienated and enemies in your minds by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled. And then verse 22, it says, In the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. There's only a small majority, a small minority of people at this point in time who have been called, who have been called and chosen by God to have experienced this reconciliation process, to even have a little taste of being reconciled to God and understanding what that means. And even though we have experienced this, those who have been called, we still fall out from time to time. We are not perfect, and we will never be perfect as long as we are physical human beings. But what that means is we have a commitment. We have a job, a commitment that we made at baptism that we will do better. We will work to do better. We will continue. That's the contract that we signed at, at baptism. It was the covenant that we made as individuals, that we will continue to work and we continue to strive. And by promising to continue to do better, God has promised to give us his Holy Spirit as assistance, as a helper, to do better, to live better, to change. God's Spirit leads us to asking for forgiveness. This repentance process, getting back to reconciliation, a state where God is a friend, not an enemy. God's ultimate plan calls for all of mankind to have this opportunity of reconciliation, this opportunity to be children of God. And it's an amazing thing. There's a peace that comes with that. I don't know how many of you, but there, there's a sense of peace after having hands laid upon you and having a minister of God pray that you receive the Holy Spirit. There's a calm. There's a peace that comes with that may not last very long because we continue to go out and sin. But for an instant, for an instant, we're washed clean and we receive God's Holy Spirit. And it's an amazing feeling knowing that we have that beautiful relationship with God, that there was this reconciliation that had taken place, that we are on the right track of knowing where we want to go. All of humanity will get to experience this. There's a point in time where the majority, no longer a minority, but the majority of humanity will get to experience this reconciliation, this process of drawing closer to God. And it's going to begin at Jesus Christ's return. Symbolized by just a few days ago on the Feast of Trumpets, that blast of the seventh trumpet and the return of the rightful king to establish something different. God doesn't leave anyone out of his plan. God hasn't forgotten anybody. Nobody slips through the cracks. He has this perfect plan in place to make sure that all will be given a chance in their time for this reconciliation. Today symbolizes a significant step in that reconciliation process. That process of removing one of those tempters. The primary tempter that puts a wedge between us and God. Satan has spent 
years upon years trying to remove children from a relationship with God. And he's continue, going to continue until the symbolism of today actually is fulfilled. And he'll be locked away for a period of time where he can no longer deceive man. That's what today represents and symbolizes. This, he's no longer able to deceive humanity. That his influence, his sway, his tricks, they're removed. His influence will be temporarily removed. We know it's for a thousand years that humanity, humanity will be given an opportunity to try to figure this reconciliation process out with God without having that influence without being manipulated. And Jesus Christ is going to show a very distinct difference between the two rulers. The ruler of this world now, Satan, and the ruler to come. Flip back to 2 Corinthians with me. There's a lot of different names for Satan in the Bible. Here in 2 Corinthians makes it plain as day of the system that we live under right now. If you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 3. This shows us what we're dealing with. What, we, what we're actually living through. says, but even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. That's why we know the only chance that we have to become children now is if God specifically calls us. If there's an unveiling of what Satan has been able to cover up. God's very specific. He's smart when it comes to that. He's a genius. He knew what we needed as human beings to get us to become his children. He's doing everything he can to make sure that he saves the majority of his children. And that process is calling the minority right now. Calling a minority. Satan's only been given a temporary amount of time. This temporary age that he has to influence people until he is actually restrained. He no longer has an impact. This is that reference that we read in the Old Testament earlier by Mr. Crone. It lays out, and sometimes, sometimes I, I wish we did some of these physical things still because I couldn't imagine the impact that this would have. But at the same time, I know if we took two goats and we sacrificed one and we took one and just let it off in the woods, People would think we're even crazier than they already do. Uh, there would be some something on the web about how crazy we are because we're, we're letting goats loose and it's going to end up on the highway and cause wrecks and who knows what would happen. We can't find the wilderness anywhere to just let this goat go, go wandering off. But if you go back to Leviticus 16, let's read it through a little bit here. There have been times that people get confused with who these two goats represent because of the wording. Mr. Crone was good to, to clarify that. That scapegoat, that scapegoat is not, not who some think it is. But when we align it with exactly what Scripture says and who Jesus Christ was, we, we see a difference. If you look at Leviticus 16 and verse 5, we'll read uh, verses 5 through 9. It says, and he shall take from the congregation of the, uh, the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats as a sin offering and one ram as a burnt offering. Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering, which is for himself and make atonement for himself and for his house. So he had to make a specific offering to reconcile to God before he could even go into the Holy of Holies. He shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Then Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other for lot for the scapegoat. 
and Aaron shall bring the goat on which the Lord's lot fell and, the offer, and offer it as a sin offering. I always find it amazing that God's very specific. God is the one that picked. God chooses which goat sacrificed. And it fits perfectly with his big plan, the large plan that we have seen bits of it play out. They didn't understand the impact that this was going to have future. But like many of the prophecies that we talked about, the fulfillments, the ultimate fulfillments are much greater, much more impactful. And so we have Jesus Christ as the sacrifice. We have Jesus Christ as our sacrifice. And then Mr. Crone went through the second goat. What takes place with that second goat? It's actually laid hands upon. All the sins are placed on that goat. That goat's not a sacrifice for the sins, but that goat is blamed for the sins. It was Satan who we find was the first sinner in the Bible. That rebellion against God, when he denied God's authority, God's power, when he thought he could usurp God, that was the first sin. And then we watch Adam and Eve do the first human sin. And it was through his manipulating and his twisting of words, of minds, trying to convince them that God isn't exactly who he says he is. He doesn't mean exactly what he says he's going to do. Surely you won't die. He's good at manipulating. He's still good today at manipulating us, twisting us, making us rationalize that some sins are okay. I've been guilty multiple times. I'm sure you can think of multiple things where you have convinced yourself, oh, this would be okay. And it wasn't until later down the line we think, oh, that was not okay. I should have done that differently. And it's what we do from that point forward is that reconciliation process of figuring out if we can repair that relationship with God, which we know we don't have to repair it. It's we just have to change. God has already taken the steps to repair it, to give us a process to repair it. But this live goat, this live goat that's released is Satan. It's a representation of, of what's going to happen of Satan. Placing all of those sins of Israel, the responsibility for those sins on him. That errors that they made, he was a driving force in causing them. He was a main impact. He wasn't the only reason. Yeah, as humans, we are without Satan, we would still sin. But there's a, a different level. And that's what we're looking forward to during the millennium. Is that we're going to get to help people using good, godly spirits to help them. Not try to convince them and coerce them into doing something different, which is what Satan has done for years upon years. So we see that he's driven out. That goat's driven out into the wilderness where there's no humanity. Nothing else around. just barren we don't we don't know what it is but it's not close to anything that's what we find is going to happen through this process of the day of atonement what this symbolizes and turn with me all the way back to revelation we'll see what we're we're looking forward to revelation chapter 20 right in the very beginning says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in, in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal on him, so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. So we have this glorious time of where his influence is no longer there. We'll be able to teach humanity about love, respect, God's laws, and what it means to place them in your hearts, have them written on our hearts, what it means to truly be submissive, to be humble, loving. It'll be a very different approach than we deal with today, what we work through today. It'll be a society, it'll be nations, that are godly nations, led by a godly king. Jesus Christ 
will sit on his rightful throne and instruct and lead as a leader really should. That's what we pray for today, that we have good leaders. We pray that God puts those leaders in place. But we know at some point God's going to put leaders in place that lead us down a path that's not so pleasant. Because that's part of the plan. It has to get worse to get to the kingdom of God before it gets better. That's why sometimes it's hard to pray that thy kingdom come. It's because we know that there's turmoil that comes with that. There, there's devastation. There's death. Suffering. But it's the glory at the end of that is why we can still pray. It's hard to sit in our, our nice houses with running water, heat, air conditioning, when it's 110 degrees out, we can sit in our 65 degree house. If we were in the middle of Africa, we wouldn't have those luxuries. I think we might pray a little bit more fervently than uh, we probably do here at times. Sometimes we have to put into perspective what our brothers and sisters around the world go through on a daily basis. That'll help us to put in perspective what we're dealing with. Then drop down to verse 9. It says, they went up on the breadth of earth and surrounded the camp of the Satan. So this is after Satan is released for that short period of time. Surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them, who was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, uh, better translated, were cast. And they will be tormented day and night forever. So we get into this process. I've always been curious about this, of whether or not this is really going to be one of those things where God just says, yep, done. No more army. Well, whether this will actually be a fight like we see now, some type of physical calamity that's caused. Because it makes it sound like it's going to be done. They're just gone. The impact of that last rebellion I don't think it's going to be strung along because we quickly move into this next phase of God's plan and what that means for humanity. But when we look at these details, we look at what the future holds for us, it aligns very closely with what we read in the Old Testament. We're given some different, some, some specific, de- we're, without being given specific details, it correlates to what we read in the Old Testament. And how this plays out with the, the Azazel goat. I try to use Azazel over scapegoat just because it, it's easier than confusing people at times. It's nowhere in the Bible do we find any reference that Satan's going to be turned to a physical being and be destroyed like everybody else. We don't find that. That's not what matches up with scripture. We also don't find that he's going to be tortured in some pit we don't find that either but it does say he's going to be tormented day and night and we've come to the understanding that what that what this means is it's going to be that similar penalty to what that goat had being cast out into outer darkness where there's nothing no one no one to influence that torment It's going to be a mental anguish, a mental torture, because everything that he ever had was stripped away. Any influence, any purpose is going to be gone. He no longer has anybody to manipulate. He has no authority over anyone. He goes from being the ruler of this age to, I imagine, lonely, darkness, I don't know if he can feel cold. But there's going to be some type of mental anguish because he is lost. He has finally completely lost everything. For this period of time now, he still has small victories. When he can turn children of God away, when he can make convince people that they don't need to ask for forgiveness, that they don't need reconciliation to God, He gets little victories. But at that point, he'll have nothing. His rulership is over. His kingdoms are over. 
Any significance that he ever had is completely gone. Non-existent. And that's going to be a glorious time for us. It's going to be a magnificent thing. And that's what this millennial, this foretaste of the millennium is as we get into the Feast of Tabernacles. That's why it's so significant for us. Why we picture Jesus Christ at the helm, ruling, leading, guiding, and not having Satan around. Doing our best to remove ourselves from the world. We go to these places that are nice, they're fun. Beaches, mountains, lots of things to do. Whether it's museums or arcades. One of my boys one, one time, we, we talked about where we were going for the feast. Lizzie and I were talking about where we were thinking about going. We started to get their input. And he chimes in, do they have an arcade? Yep, they have an arcade. All right, it's a feast then. <laughs> all, all it takes is an arcade. It's considered the feast. Maybe we went to Gatlinburg too, one too many times in a row. <laughs> but we go to these busy places, but our mindset has to be that we are getting Satan out of our lives and we're reconciling to God. And we're focusing on the plan that he has. So how do we make this happen? Because it's hard for us to pick up, leave jobs, take, take time away from jobs, and actually remove our mindset and refocus it on, this is a millennial time. This is what is symbolizing this thousand-year rule of Jesus Christ ruling. How do we do that? Head over to 1 Peter with me. There's a refocus that has to take place. There, there's a change in mindset. There's a change in attitude. Because we recognize how hazardous Satan is and how much havoc he can lead in our lives or cause. In 1 Peter chapter 5, if you look at verses 5 through 9, says, likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive one to, to one another and be clothed with, clothed with humility. So it talks about, yeah, the younger generations, respect your elders, submit. And it immediately turns around and says, everybody submit to everyone. Submit, submission has this huge role in this attitude, in this mindset of what it is that we're supposed to be changing in us. It says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all of your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Satan does want to devour us. He wants to consume each and every one of our chance to become children of God. He's going to continue to do that, especially around the holy days. Year after year, we see things flare up right around the holy days. Little stumbling blocks that are sometimes just annoyances, and other times they have a significant impact on our, our attitude and, and the focus that we have of what we're trying to do. Because it's supposed to be a joyous time for us. We, we love the holy days. We love them because of what they mean and the significance they have. But he's going to do everything he can to keep us from benefiting from these times and focusing on God. One of the things it mentions here says the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood. This doesn't necessarily mean that every single one of us are going to come down with cancer or be, have problems with drinking alcohol or gossiping. We're each going to fight our own little battles, but we're each battling. We're each struggling. We each have different vulnerabilities in this world that we're all going through, that we're all striving to overcome, defeat. We all have to be careful because Satan is lurking to capitalize on any faults that we have. It doesn't matter what it is, but it can all be trampled. It can all be stamped out 
through submission and humility. Submission and humility. We're instructed to be humble. We have to humble ourselves. It never really works when somebody else tries humbling you, does it? I've never seen that happen. I've seen people attempt to do that, to humble one another. But there has to be a, a heart change. There has to be a mindset of, I am going to be humble. When you tell somebody to be humble, I literally have never seen it work out. There's something about humility that that is it. That is the character and the attitude. We have to have that reliance on God. He says he's going to be there. He says he's going to be there. Today, today we're humbling ourselves with fasting. It's one of the humility aspects of the Day of Atonement. Showing the respect for God by being obedient. And it shows how physical we are. By the end of the day, we're watching the minutes tick by. All right, I just need a drink. I just need a little bit of water. It's a humbling experience. It's realigning our focus, helping us to be more steadfast as we get ready for the Feast of Tabernacles. Zeroing in on what the Feast of Tabernacles symbolizes and the impact that it's going to have, and then the eighth day. Those last couple of steps in God's plan. Because think, as joyous as it is for us to get together with our couple hundred people scattered all over the world. If you're going to Utah this year, I think they have a little over a thousand or right about a thousand people. It's about the biggest feast site we have anymore. There was a day when it was 15, 20,000 people. But even with that 15 and 20,000, there's a joy and an excitement that we don't even understand until the magnitude that majority of humanity comes to the realization that they want to have a relationship with God, that they need a relationship with God. That's what the Holy Days are about. It's about realigning our focus. In the Feast of Tabernacles, we have an opportunity for more spiritual food during the Feast of Tabernacles than all the other Holy Days combined. We have more sermons, more Bible studies, more time together with brethren than any other time of the year all combined, if you look at all the Holy Days. So we need to capitalize on this time. We need to take advantage of the opportunities that we have. Because it's easy for us to think, oh, I can just skip one service. One service isn't too bad. I would really like to do this, and the only time I can do it is then. One's not too bad. Maybe we do make it there every day. Maybe we get there every day, but it's right before services start, just a couple minutes, and as they're saying amen, my feet are already pointing towards the door. We're out. We got activities to do. Arcades. The arcades are ready to go. <laughs> Whatever it may be. Is our mindset there for the right reasons? And it's hard. I know this is one of the most difficult things because focusing on God's words, God's messages and God's people, it has to be the forefront. But at the same time, we get tripped up because oftentimes that's all our vacation that we have. That's the only amount of time that we have. And so we try to turn it into a vacation at the same time of turning it into God's holy days. We need to be careful not to muddy up the two. Yeah, there's some fun things that we get to do, but we have to make sure we prioritize in the correct order. We're lining it up the way that God wants us to and not flipping it the way we want to. That's that submission, that humility that has to take place for us to understand. We're there not to just have fun. We're there for a reason to prepare ourselves for future jobs, for a future purpose. I've got one last verse, scripture. If you flip over to James chapter 4 and verse 6 with me. not too far from here. It's a couple pages over. We'll read verses 6 through 10. It says, 
but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. There's a joy, there's an excitement, and there's fun that takes place at the feast. But if it, that's at the chance of giving up that relationship with God, we really need to hone in and refocus. You know, we fast today to draw closer to God. It's not to get an extra nap in. It's so that we have extra time to spend Bible studying, spend in praying, drawing closer to God, understanding what he's doing in our lives, by putting away Satan, by pushing Satan away and rebuilding, repairing, rekindling that relationship with God. We have to repent. We have to repent and recognize that we all sin. We're all still stumbling from time to time. We choose to be steadfast in our faith. Realigning with the right intentions. You know, the lessons that we will learn from God's holy days and his festivals seem endless. That's why year after year we can go to the Feast of Tabernacles and hear messages, and they don't destroy each other. They're not the same message day after day. Sometimes they overlap. But there's a meaning and there's intentions in them. I'm just amazed at the depth of knowledge and information that I find. I'm sure you guys have been there too and just reading normal scriptures at times year after year we read some of the same ones and you have end up pulling out extra details that you've never caught on to before it's a good feeling because that means god's at the helm god's leading our path opening our eyes to more information sometimes it's understand we're ready for that next step we're under we're ready for that next part of life God has built all of it into his plan. All of it into this beautifully crafted plan. So I ask you, where's your focus this feast? Feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement, Feast of Tabernacles. Where's the focus? Remember the lessons of the Feast of Trumpets and the Day of Atonement. So that we will have a happy, we'll have a loving, a submissive, profitable, and a hopefully Satan-free Feast of Tabernacles.